Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I'm your host, Melinda Moulton, and today I have Bill Ryerson as my guest. Bill, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. You bet. You're out in Colorado. Lots of snow out there, you said. I am. The mountains, the tall mountains are just draped in snow, and I'm actually driving up into them uh, later today for a talk to the Women's Foundation of Colorado. Well, good for you. I hope you have a good set of snow tires. <laughs> I hope so, too. So let me tell my viewers a little bit about you, Bill. Bill Ryerson has more than 40 years of experience working in the field of reproductive health, including two decades of experience using the Sabido methodology of behavior change communications. He is the founder of the Population Media Center and since 2008 has also served as chair and CEO of Population Institute in Washington, D.C. Is that right? That is all correct. Well, you know, that's kind of a short little bio on you, but I got to tell you, there are reams and reams and reams of pages on Bill Ryerson and the work that you do. So let's start at the beginning, Bill. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, growing up, your education, and what led you to the work you were doing now around reproductive health. I grew up in, a, for people who are old enough to know this reference, an Aussie and Harriet type of environment. So uh, I grew up in a very tranquil home with uh, parents who filled traditional roles uh, in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, uh, which is a college town. Uh, I ended up uh, going away to college, to Amherst and then graduate school at Yale. But one of the things that really struck me when I was growing up was the fact that my mother had been the valedictorian of her high school class but because she was a woman, she wasn't allowed to go to college. Her brother was sent to college instead. And, you know, I, I at, as a teenager, started questioning, why are we discriminating against half the world's population if women are not to be given full educational opportunities? So it started early on realizing that there was some inherent unfairness in the United States, not to mention the rest of the world. How interesting. So your mother never did go to college. She never did. And how old were you when that revelation hit you? Um, you're asking me to go back into the depths of my own memory. And the answer is, I'm guessing sort of early adolescence, maybe 12, 13, 14. I'm not sure. Interesting. Um, interesting, Bill. Well, so your mother, you know, the fate of your mother had a huge impact on the work that you've done. So give us an overview of the work of Population Media Center, whose goals are to empower women, address population growth, and create a sustainable planet through storytelling. Now, your website, for my viewers out there, and I really encourage you to go visit this website, and if you're so inclined, please make a donation, populationmedia.org. Um, it's a fascinating place to visit, and I hope that you'll help support this work. So tell us a little bit about Population Media Center, Bill. Thank you, Melinda. Um, the organization really is filling an important gap in the whole field of what's called behavior change communications. Uh, when you think about environmental regulations, um, you know, a lot can be done through policies uh, to control greenhouse gases and deforestation and those kinds of things. But it's a very bad idea to use regulations to control um, uh, human numbers outstripping the capacity of the planet to handle them. And it's very clear from uh, a 2019 report by the UN Environment Program that, uh, in fact, the primary causes of the loss of biodiversity that makes the planet habitable uh, are number one, expanding human farming, and number two, expanding human habitation. So these two things are driven by population growth. And when people think the only environmental issue is climate change, and they therefore say, okay, well, it's overconsumption in the West, that's, that's partially true, but it's not the only environmental issue. And biodiversity loss is a critical threat to uh, sustainability of the planet. Because if we eliminate the web of life that makes the planet habitable, we may find ourselves living in an uninhabitable place. 
Um, and of course, climate change is a factor in this. Uh, when people are cutting down rainforests and turning them into soy fields in the developing world, they are eliminating the lungs of the earth that, that absorb large amounts of carbon dioxide. So in fact, not only the UN Environment Program, but here in Colorado, uh, Brian uh, O'Neill did a detailed analysis of the role of population growth with regard to climate change. And he found it's not 100% of the issue, but it's also not zero. It's roughly 25% of the issue because of loss of uh, wilderness areas, and particularly rainforests, uh, and also the fact that each person added to the population does have a carbon footprint. And while the per capita emissions in uh, low-income countries are much lower than they are in the West, the numbers, uh, 80 million net growth per year, uh, add considerably to the climate's output. And of course, the goals of people in developing countries is to increase their consumption, increase their carbon footprint. And no one has yet succeeded in decoupling uh, consumption from carbon output. So just in terms of sustainability, uh, population is an important issue, obviously controversial, but also it can be addressed in a human rights format. And in fact, girls' education and stopping child marriage are two of the key steps that are needed to help women achieve self-efficacy with regard to family-sized decision-making. Uh, so for every year a girl is further educated in secondary school, her average lifetime fertility rate will drop. Uh, and this has been clearly demonstrated in country after country. So promoting girls' education and, and convincing parents that they should not sell their daughter into marriage at 12, 13, 14, 15, which is happening in many countries. Um, you know, 12 million girls married as children per year. Uh, this is uh, critically important to change attitudes. So there's a lot that can be done through communications that cannot be done in any other way. And the most human rights-based approach to communications is not telling people what to do. A lot of health messaging says, you know, you wear or use a bed net or wear a condom to prevent HIV. But nobody wants to be lectured to, and telling people what to do is, in many ways, demeaning. Instead, what Population Media Center is doing is creating entertainment serialized dramas on radio and television uh, so far in 57 countries in which key middle-of-the-road characters designed based on extensive formative research in each country uh, gradually evolve into role models and sort out conflicting advice from the positive and negative characters that populate all melodrama. Uh, so, in fact, as the audience is uh, becoming addicted to the program and in love with the characters, they're seeing these characters trying new things, sometimes making mistakes and suffering the consequences, sometimes uh, a, a, attempting something that is new, like girls' education, and realizing benefits. And so over time, the audience is more and more motivated to emulate their behavior. And as they become uh, a very positive role models for the audience, they're also showing the audience how to deal with the pushback that comes from trying something new and showing, obviously, the benefits of their new behavior. So we find in many of the countries, in fact, all of the countries where we're working, people are modeling their behavior after these characters. And in many cases, we're seeing dramatic changes in social norms based on people's uh, modeling their behavior after the character. So for example, our first program in Ethiopia was accompanied by a drop in total fertility rate of a full child in just two years, which is dramatic change. And married women who were listening, and it was just under half of all women were listening, tripled their use of family planning during that broadcast, while non-listeners had a marginal increase. Uh, at clinics in that country, 
during that broadcast, 26% of new clients, when asked what motivated the visit to get reproductive health and family planning services, named the program by name. And we've actually measured in some countries even more. In Sierra Leone, 50% citing the program. In Northern Nigeria, 67%. So people don't go home at night to hear health messages, but they do go home at night to relax and be entertained. And we're there entertaining them. And That's they also, though, they're they're learning, but they're not bored. So they're happy to be learning. And we get a lot of letters and text messages thanking us for the way the program has improved their own life situation. Fascinating. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've read Paul Hawkins' book on the 100 things that we need to do to save the planet. And I think one of the top five is the education of women, of girls. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, this is, this is such a critical uh, step. Um, and of course, this is a perfect offset to child marriage. Uh, right. Once a woman is educated, she can get a job, and that then improves the income stream to the family. That also gives the male partner a motivation to not interrupt that income stream um, by avoiding another pregnancy. So it, it provides the couple a much stronger sense of the benefit of uh, the wife working um, and, of course, be because she's further educated, she she ends up being a better educated mother and a better role model for her children, and they then pursue higher education as well. Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit about men's boots on women's necks, a little bit next, a little bit too, yes. about the effect of you know male patri patriarchy. But so much of your work is centered on population control, and I believe it was back in the Reagan years when our country stopped funding reproductive health around the world. Um, and you've been working on that. Now, I'm going to move on to a few of all the other questions. So you must be deeply discouraged by the current decade in the country, in our country, where women here have had their reproductive rights reduced and in some states virtually eliminated. Why are men in this country so hell-bent on destroying women's rights? And what is your organization doing to fight back? Not all men are hell-bent on destroying women's rights. Not all men, but, but a lot of our leaders who... Uh, who yes. You, yeah. Um, it's... It's a good question, and we're not the only country where this is going on. There's a lot of uh, examples that I can point to around the world where authoritarian right-wing governments are replacing democratically elected governments, and a part of their agenda is controlling women. And why this is, it's hard to know because it does lead to increased poverty and human suffering, but nevertheless, it's the case. And and I think the Dobbs decision in the U.S. is uh, one of the outstanding examples of how reversing human rights uh, is part of this agenda. So to address this issue, in fact, we, uh, within a week or two of the Dobbs decision, we're on uh, the air with a podcast called Crossing the Line with stories of individual women having to cross state lines to access abortion services. Uh, we've also done a Hollywood show uh, that ended up being the longest running program in the history of the network Hulu, uh, dealing with teen pregnancy among American Hispanics. It was filmed at a fictional high school in East Los Angeles called What's East the name Los of it? High. What's it called? East Los High. So the, the high school was East Los High and the name of the show was East Los High. And it's about the lives of the students at this high school and their love lives and so on. But it ends up in season one, uh, addressing the issue of unwanted teen pregnancy and access to abortion services. So we have done that and we've done with the help of Gloria Steinem, who's on our, on our advisory board, a podcast called The State of Women. Uh, having said all of that, reaching the US population in significant numbers is difficult because of the fragmentation of our media market. So, I mean, we certainly as a small NGO are working to do what we can, but it's much harder than in a place like Ethiopia or Nigeria where we can get on government broadcasting and reach a majority of the population with one program. So, uh, you know, and women in this country, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Women in this country. Oh, hold on a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a respiratory illness. Um, 
Women in this country, I'm getting all worked up about this bill. Women in this country are still being paid only 83 cents to the dollar of men. Um, so, I mean, we have so much work to do. I want to move into what you brought up about authoritarian and frighteningly possible fascist governments around the around the world. Um, because um, how do we end uh, the patriarchy and create a pathway to equality, as you state, regeneration? How do we do that? Well, clearly, uh, men are involved. And so one of the things that sets PMC apart from other organizations working in gender and reproductive health work is we don't see our work as being limited to reaching women. Um, in many countries, men are, are making the decisions, sometimes over the objections of their spouses or partners. So what we do is in our programs create charismatic male characters who, like our audience, start out pretty much in the middle of the road, uh, but they are attracting male followers. And then they go through a transition in their own thinking in front of a mass audience about the humanity of their wife and daughters. And this has uh, led to dramatic changes in men's attitudes. I'll give you a an example. One of our programs in Ethiopia dealt with a woman running for higher office. The baseline survey before the program went on the air showed most women were okay with the idea of a woman, woman running for higher office, but men were not. Only 33% of men thought this was acceptable. So we had characters in the program that men identified with who came to understand the benefit of equality for women, including in leadership roles. And by the end of the program, with 47% of men in the country listening, male positive attitudes towards a woman running for higher office had doubled to 66%. So it is possible, again, through role modeling, using the work of Stanford psychologist Albert Bandura, which is all about how role models influence behavior, to take people through a transition in a relatively short period of time. But it requires support to make that happen. It doesn't happen on its own. And as we know, right-wing organizations, not only in the United States, but coming from the US all over Africa, I run into people saying that fundamentalist evangelicals have showed up trying to change the law to ban women from working, trying to instill their own point of view in other countries. So there's a lot of money going into this battle for hearts and minds, and it's critically important uh, for all of us that we address these issues through uh, programs that help people understand the benefits of egalitarian living. Absolutely, and I think we're seeing in this country how leaders can affect the thinking of a population uh, quite clearly right now. Yes. Now, PMS won the 2024 Campaign Nonprofit Excellence Award, Communicator Award for Excellence in Integrated Campaigns. I want to congratulate you and your team. Thank You've you. won numerous awards. Um, so I just want you to know that I have reached out to environmental leaders on many occasions. Mm -hmm. and, have I, and I have asked them why they never, ever bring up population as a threat to our environmental future. You say 25 percent. Boy, I think... I, I, we're going to get into this, but any, isn't it true that humans are basically destroying the planet and usually mostly our industrialized nations. And if we keep having more and more humans, our species may cease to exist in a quickly warming climate. I mean, is there not a thread here between population and environment, which you're making, but a lot of our top environmental leaders and I've challenged them and they sort of look at me and like, oh, but they should be on the front lines of our reproductive freedom movement. The environmentalist. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, having been trained as an environmentalist myself, I did graduate work in ecology and evolutionary biology. Uh, I understand that many environmentalists think first of regulation. And so when they talk about regulating family size, they find themselves getting into trouble very quickly. So a lot of them have said, okay, this is too hot to handle but they privately will recognize its importance. They have no clue about the fact that role modeling 
is all that's needed and, and coercion is a very bad idea and will backfire. So uh, there are environmental leaders, particularly the Center for Biological Diversity that do make the link with population. In fact, Center for Biological Diversity uh, produces endangered species condoms uh, with very cute photos and little sayings on the box like um, cover with care, save the polar bear. So, you know, they're, they're doing this through humor, but many environmental organizations will only acknowledge this issue um, in, in private, but not in public. And they, they, it's because they have found this is a hot button issue and they really don't know how to deal with it. Wow. We have worked with environmental organizations over the years and, you know, some of them will tiptoe into dealing with it, but then they'll back out again. So, but it's very clear. And from the UN Environment Program report I mentioned earlier, that if population continues to grow now at over 8 billion, you know, to 9 billion, 10 billion, 11 billion, all of the causes of the environmental organizations whether it's saving polar bears or saving elephants, will come to naught because they cannot right. deal with the dramatic impact of expanding human farming and habitation. Thank you for that. Well, our, um, to my viewers, I want to remind you that I'm talking to Bill Ryerson, the founder and president of, po of Population Media Center. And that website is populationmedia.org. And I really encourage you to go there. I just want to tell you that I loved your interview with Gloria Steinem. I loved watching that. Also, Population Media Center has a charity score of 100%, earning it a four-star rating. And they say that your organization aligns with your passions, and that's a great accolade. I want to honor you on that, because that doesn't Thank always you. happen with international nonprofits. Um, uh, Population Media Center has helped 500 million people live healthier lives in more than 50 countries. So now let's talk about sustainability. Uh, a lot of folks use the word sustainability. It's still pretty popular. Um, and I'm wondering if that world, word really holds any power anymore because our planet is heading toward a moment in time where human existence may not be able to survive. So in my work, I have been using the word adaptability because mm -hmm. truly, I don't believe we can sustain what we have, can we? Don't you believe we have to adapt to where we're at? We're certainly beyond the point of just sustaining the planet uh, through preventive measures. Uh, climate change is here and we're seeing increasing catastrophes for uh, lives and people's welfare through flooding, forest fires, um, uh, heat waves, et cetera. Uh, so it's very clear that adaptation is important. Uh, it's not, of course, the only thing. We need to do a lot more to mitigate uh, carbon dioxide output and to mitigate uh, conversion of rainforests into uh, crop fields. So there is a lot to, to be done on both sides. I'll give you a couple of examples of our work in this area. Thank you. Thank Jane you. Jane Goodall reached out to us and said, could you deal with consumption of wild animals, what are called bushmeat, in eastern Congo? So with support from the Jane Goodall Institute, along with addressing reproductive health issues, we addressed uh, consumption of bushmeat, which of course can lead to various diseases, let alone decimation of endangered species. Uh, we were dealing particularly with uh, apes and um, chimpanzees that she was studying. And the program had dramatic effects on behavior among listeners with regard to consumption of bushmeat. In Rwanda, we did a program that was cited by 34% of reproductive health clients as the reason they had come. But it also had a storyline dealing with reforestation in the areas where the mountain gorillas live, where a character then decides to replant the area he had cut down because it caused a landslide. And we partnered with the Ministry of Environment and they asked new tree seedling buyers, buyers what had motivated their decision to buy tree seedlings and 11% of them named our program. With the Voice of Vietnam, we did a show modeling climate resistant seed varieties for farmers in Vietnam. And again, an impact on their decisions about what seed varieties to get. So, you know, I don't think 
many of your listeners would tune in for something called the recycling soap opera. But if you incorporate uh, storylines related to people's lives in a program that also has love and romance that address environmental issues, people will pay attention. And indeed, I think in this country, we desperately need that type of program to address uh, climate related behaviors of the American public. So how, how do my viewers see your shows? How do we, where are your shows, where, how do they tune in? All of our programs are in local languages in every country. They can certainly go to our website and there's a map uh, under our international programs uh, section of the website where they can click on any country where we have done programming and listen to a few episodes. But, you know, they're going to need for Ethiopia, Amharic or right. Oromipa right. or Somali in Kenya, Kiswahili in Somali. Um, so uh, there are a few English language programs, perhaps the easiest one for people to access if they have uh, a subscription to Hulu is our program East Los High because that's in English. It has some Spanglish in it, just like the audience we were trying to reach. But it was in the top five for all five years it was on Hulu. And a lot of people are still consuming it. That's outstanding. That's extraordinary. Um, so I have, um, I want to talk to you a, a little bit about your words of wisdom uh, for your for the young today. I mean, our kids coming out of the pandemic, which I think with the population. Um, oh, that's something I wanted to ask you. Let me ask you that right now. Where do you think our population is going to be in uh, in 10 years from where it is right now? Um, here's, here's my best guess, that we will still have growing numbers on the planet. We know that infinite growth on a finite planet is impossible. I don't believe we will ever get to 10 billion. I think we will see a crash in the population before then. Um, and the best way to avoid the worst that could happen is for people to level off the growth rate uh, around the world and to start choosing smaller families. So yeah, really. I, think, I think we're in for a rough ride. My guess is in the next 10 years, we'll see continued growth. The PMC is not present in enough countries to uh, affect that growth at the level that it needs to be. Um, but I do think we will see a leveling off. And, and particularly, uh, we can, as I mentioned with Ethiopia, we can see dramatic declines in fertility rate in uh, countries where we're working. Uh, so it is quite possible, as we saw in Europe uh, over 100 years ago, that people will choose to uh, pursue smaller families and spreading ideas related to the both health and economic benefits of smaller families, I think, is what will drive people to adopting those new norms. Are you working with our with our federal government to try to get funding back to those countries to help with reproductive health and that the U.S. gets back more involved in helping to support these countries? Indeed, we have support from USAID. We've also had support from U.S. Fish and Wildlife for our work in Rwanda. But um, the good news about U.S. funding is that neither Reagan nor Trump had the ability to cut off support by the bureaucracy of USAID for gender and reproductive health work. And we find very sympathetic audiences at USAID missions um, in countries where we're working. So we had support in Zambia, for example, uh, in response to an unsolicited proposal that I sent to USAID. And because by the time the two programs in two local languages ended, Listeners were 60% more likely than non-listeners after controlling for other variables to report using modern methods of contraception. USAID said, how about another season of both programs and funded a, a continuation? So, so we have want very well-motivated people within the U.S. government. It's just not necessarily found at the top. Well, and depending on the election coming up, we'll see about all that. But um, indeed. so you have you ever won an Emmy? We've been nominated for six. We have not won an Emmy. 
Well, you should uh, win one. Of I had six nominations, including three for Daniel Vega, who played the abused girlfriend in the series. Outstanding. Well, I want to ask you as one of my last question is what are your words of wisdom for our young today in a world that's facing an upsurge in fascist leadership, climate crisis, the eroding of truth and science, and, you know, the future pandemics, all the challenges that our children today will be facing as they become adults. What's your words of wisdom for these kids? Set your own personal mission and pursue that through your lifetime is my word of wisdom. And it's based on what I've discovered. If you're doing something you feel is doing good for the world and you care deeply about it, you will have a much more rewarding career than if you're just a pencil pusher for somebody else's company and doing it until 5 p.m. and can't wait to get home from work. Well, so a lot of us- have a personal mission. A lot of us have had those jobs, Bill. Um, you know, but a lot of us have tried to expand our world into trying to do good work, too. And I got to tell you, you are one of the world's treasures. Your commitment to the ongoing tireless work to life, to lift women up and give them voices beyond measure. And I believe that having someone on you like you, Bill, on this planet gives me hope for the future of women all over the world. And for that, I say I thank you. And I thank you for bringing this ray of sunshine today. And let's talk again. Um, I'd love to interview you again in a year or so and see how we're doing in this country because a lot of women are hurting here in the U.S. and young Indeed. young women are scared. And there is a war on women yeah. in the United States of America. And, uh, and I think you're one of the heroes stepping up, one of the men that is right there at the front lines. And that's Yeoman's work. And I want to thank you for that, my friend. Thank you so much, Melinda. Uh, we're very privileged to be able to work on the side of, of women and girls. Um, and we could talk for hours about the work we've done in that area. And I look forward to another opportunity. Absolutely. It's a fascinating interview. You are a fascinating man. I'm going to say goodbye to my viewers now. I'm going to ask you to hold on because I want to talk to you after this interview. But to my viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this wonderful half hour with Bill Ryerson. And to all of you, have a beautiful day. And I will see you all soon. Bye-bye.